guys welcome back to all things psw it's been an amazing journey with all of you and i truly appreciate all your feedback and your comments the reason i started this channel was to just make sure that everybody passes the NAC exam i had a lot of feedback from everybody or most people just saying i don't know what i'm doing wrong i feel like i know the material but when i go into the exam i'm failing so i'm hoping that i can help you so thank you so much for coming to my videos and just giving feedback. I only don't want to focus on the NAC exam. I also want to understand your day-to-day -day experiences and what we can do to discuss what it is to be a PSW. But overall, I'm thankful for where we are. This is also going to be a channel that will help PSW students. I'm now trying to categorize each particular module so that if you're studying, you have a little bit more material to make sure you pass because of course your grades are important if you want to do something further maybe you want to get into nursing social work or some type of undergrad degree i'm hoping that i can help you so thank you so much and i'm hoping you enjoy this video and see you next time guys have an amazing week Everybody. welcome back to our fifth video thank you so much to everyone who has liked shared and subscribed if you have not already please do so and make sure you share this video with your colleagues your friends PSW students PSWs everyone under the Sun but please be sure to make sure that you do like and subscribe so today we're going to have another video full of questions but it will be different just like the last one and that I'm focusing only on body systems so this is module three for people who do the NAC Noel exam if you know what I'm talking about so this is going to be a good resource for you if you're still a student and just want to kind of go over some questions before your exam or if you're now writing for the NAC and you want to make sure that you know exactly what to do so I'm hoping this video is helpful. Let me know, guys. Again, whatever comments you give me, whatever feedback you give me, I am trying to incorporate it in my videos. And feel free to reach me at any time. So, okay, we're going to get started. So the first question is this. You're caring for Mr. Harare and notice raised blisters on the left side or trunk of his body. He states that they are very painful. You understand that this is A, dermatitis, B, scabies, C, shingles, or D, psoriasis. So the correct answer is C, shingles. So what is shingles? Shingles is painful. Shingles is so painful to the point where you can have it and then you can still feel it years later because it's a neuropathic kind of disorder. So what that means is it's based on your nerve cells, right? But overall, it's a viral infection that results in a painful rash of raised blisters. They can appear on any side of the body, but it's usually one side. It could be the trunk, the butt, or the face. So, um, you also need to understand that sometimes shingles, of course, is more predominant when you're older. But let's say you're really stressed out or let's say, you know, your immune system's low for whatever reason, you could actually end up with shingles. They do have a vaccine that does help with shingles um, and you can get it before you get older. But at the end of the day, once you do have shingles, it's one of the most debilitating, painful disorders I've ever seen, just based on what people have told me. What's dermatitis? So I always use itis everywhere. And I'm sure if you've watched all my videos, you now hear me say it all the time. Itis means inflammation, right? So derma means skin. So it's inflammation of the skin, pretty much. But it can be caused by direct contact with a substance that causes allergic reactions or irritation. Scabies is a little bit different in that it's something where the mites go into your skin and they burrow there and they start to fertilize and grow and grow and grow and deposit more and more and more eggs. Before you know it, you just have a lot and the skin is so painful and itchy. Uh, it looks almost purple, but it's just consumed with these mites. It's such an intense itch. 
And finally, psoriasis is a persistent skin disorder that causes red scaly patches on the skin and can be found anywhere on the body. So in this particular one, shingles was right. They could also say, you see the raised blisters in one line and then you'll know, okay, this is shingles because it typically comes like in a line. All right, next question. You are working with Mr. Toon. He has an appointment at the oncology clinic. You understand that which of the following is a very dangerous form of skin cancer? A, basal cell carcinoma. B, malignant melanoma. C, squamous cell carcinoma. Or D, stage four colon cancer. So the correct answer is B. So what is malignant melanoma? So this is the deadliest form of cancer. Malignant means it's spreading to other parts of the body. Early diagnosis and treatment is critical. So what causes it? It could be exposure to UV light, to sunlight, could be the tanning beds that we all like to use, or other sources of artificial UV light. So when you're outdoor, you use sunscreen, you know, they say use sunscreen of SPF, I think 15 and over. These things really help so that you do not have this particular condition. Basal cell, however, is often a very small bump, it's smaller, and it's slightly transparent. This often occurs on areas that are also exposed to the sun, such as your head and your neck. Squamous cell carcinoma is a common form of skin cancer that develops in the squamous cells. So if you go over the anatomy of the skin, if you guys have some time, please do, just to understand where everything is located. If you look at the melanoma, it goes all the way down. It's very deep. You'll see the difference with like, okay, basal is just over here, squamous is more in this area, but malignant melanoma is going all the way down. It's very deep in the skin tissue, right? So you need to take a look at that. And I believe it's in your book as well. And then finally, colon cancer stage four is a deadly aggressive form of cancer. But the question asks skin cancer. So if you were not reading, you would maybe have picked D because you think, oh yeah, for sure, stage four, like that's the last stage. But at the end of the day, you really need to read the question three times over to understand what it is that they're asking for specifically. So the correct answer was, Next question. Daisy just had an amputation below the knee. What can you expect? Select all that apply. A, you can expect her to ambulate within one week after the surgery. B, you can perform a range of motion below the knee by following the care plan. C, you can expect phantom limb pain. D, you can understand that the amputation may happen due to gangrene, or E, you can expect that Daisy has positive body image. So the correct answer for this is C and D. So just to back up a little bit, I did do a little bit of a mistake. I put ROM on purpose, and then I said range of motion when I was saying it. But what I'm trying to illustrate is you need to know what these terms mean. Because yes, they can definitely put ROM. And if you don't know what ROM means, then you're going to have a situation. So I should have read it as ROM. Um, but I just want you to be aware. But overall, the correct answer is C and D. So what is an amputation? So an amputation is a removal of a part of a leg or part of a hand, a part of an arm, whatever the case may be. Because maybe there's serious injury. Maybe someone's diabetic. But there's no more blood flow. Um, if there's normal blood flow, that means they got gangrene where it's black. So you need to remove this body part because it's not functioning anymore. So that's an amputation. So of course, to be amputated is not very nice. It will definitely, definitely affect your body image, not in a positive way, in a negative way, right? So now let's look at the answers. So the first one was you can expect her to ambulate within one week. Not quite. She's now getting used to maybe using a wheelchair or now she's using crutches. So you are not expecting that ambulation to happen quickly. 
So that one is false. B, you can perform range of motion below the knee. How are you going to perform range of motion below a knee that does not exist? That does not make sense. So that's why that's wrong. But C is definitely right. So what happens is because someone was so used to have a body part, we have what we call phantom limb pain. Back in the day, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists would say, oh, these people are crazy because they can still feel pain on an area that's not there. Until later, they made discoveries that even though you remove a body part, the nerve cells don't die, that you still have a feeling down there, even though down there doesn't exist. They will tell you, I'm burning in my toes. And then you look, there are no toes. I'm tingling in my toes. I'm feeling pain. So these things are not there, but because of phantom limb pain, they experience it. And it's actually something that you need to incorporate as a PSW to ensure that they are actually okay. So phantom limb pain is definitely a part of amputation. So we like that. So we check C, right? D, you understand that the amputation may have been due to gangrene. Yes, we discussed that as well. And then you can expect that Daisy has positive body image. We also discussed that and that is false. So the correct answer is C and D. All right, next question. Gout is caused by the accumulation of which of the following? A, hydrochloric acid, B, acetic acid, C, uric acid, D, sulfuric acid. So the right answer is C, uric acid. Um, so this is just something to know. Um, I don't have much explanation for it, but all the other acids, I just added them just for fun. But yeah, so gout is caused by the accumulation of uric acid in the cartilage of a joint. The signs include severe pain, swelling, redness, warmth, and stiffness of the joint as well. Next question. Mr. Gore is experiencing blurred vision, slurred speech, headache, and confusion. What could be happening? A. Cerebrovascular accident, CVA. B. Myocardial infarction, MI. C. Seizure or D. Meningitis. So the correct answer is A. So Mr. Gore is having a stroke. But you note here, they did not say stroke. They said cerebrovascular accident because they want you to understand that a stroke is a cerebrovascular accident, right? So what happens in a stroke? This is where you have a sudden loss of brain function. There are many, many symptoms for a stroke. Some symptoms include weakness, trouble speaking. All of a sudden, one side is drooping, the other isn't. You can't really let out your words. You're drooling a lot. That's a sign of a stroke. So we have an acronym or mnemonic that's called FAST to deal with a stroke. So look up F-A-S-T stroke and you'll get so much information. But this is like where you look at the face and then you look at the body, you look at the speech and then time. Time is important to get someone to the hospital because you want to ensure that they get there in a timely manner before there's more damage. So a stroke is, yes, a bad thing, but if you get to the hospital as fast as you can, the damages may not be so bad. So you want to be sure of these symptoms. Another thing that I always tell people, I tell my students, I tell everyone, if you see anyone with signs of like a heart attack or a stroke, get a baby aspirin and just let someone chew that. That will really help because aspirin is an anticoagulant. It starts to open up the blood vessels and gives you time before you get to the doctor or to the hospital. It's not even a doctor you're going to at this point. It's an emergency. So you're going to the emergency room, right? But at least chew on that aspirin. And then in that way, you're going to be a little bit better. Okay, the next one is the MI. So an MI is a myocardial infarction. So card means heart. So this is a heart attack. So this is when one or more areas of the heart muscles don't get enough oxygen. So the symptoms here are not relating. If they said them, something like chest pain, pain in one arm or something, I'll be like, okay, that's heart attack. 
but they're not saying that. They spoke more about the vision, the speech, the headache, and confusion. And it shows me that it's more in the cranium or the brain versus it being more in my heart anatomy. So in the um, heart attack, there's no blood flow to the heart muscle or it's blocked. A seizure is a convulsion. It may be violent or subtle. So seizures are interesting in that sometimes you can have a seizure and not know it. It's just that you stare into the distance and then you kind of forget where you were when you come to. That's an example of a seizure. But you can also have a very violent seizure where everyone can see you rolling on the floor. And then that's also a seizure. So a seizure is very, very complex. And that's a part of epilepsy. If you just want to review the epilepsy section, just to say, okay, epilepsy is related to a seizure. What does that really mean? Last but not least, meningitis. Again, my itis is here. Itis means inflammation. So it's inflammation of the meninges. And we did talk about meninges in the last video. Uh, this was video number four. If you missed it, please go and check it out. And that will explain what this is. Okay. Number six. You are working at, an, at AALTC with a diverse group of patients. You understand that hypertension is more common amongst individuals of African, South African, and Aboriginal descent. True or false? The answer is A, true. So guys, I am proudly, proudly African, but I will let you know that my mom did have hypertension and I always have to watch it for myself. You know, and it's not that I'm eating anything bad. I would say I don't really like salt, but it's just genetics. This is the biological factor to disease or to disorders, right? So the answer is true. So if you're of an African, South, a South Asian or Aboriginal descent, then definitely you fall into this particular stuff, right? So what is hypertension? Hypertension is high blood pressure. It's typically measured with values over 140 over 90 mmHg, like millimeters of mercury, pretty much is that what that means. So you just measure with the cuff and then you see it and you're like, oh my gosh, I have high blood pressure. Do not despair. There are many ways to actually deal with blood pressure or address it. And these could just be daily changes like lifestyle modifications. You don't always have to rush to take medication. You could take walks, you could do acupuncture, you could go for massages, you can do a lot, but I digress. But at the end of the day, we need to understand that if we're from a specific ethnic background, that we are more predisposed to having hypertension. So what they were asking in this question is that particular factor, but other factors could be my age, my weight, my physical activity. So for my weight, even if I lose five pounds, I've already decreased the millimeters of mercury just a little bit. I decrease another five pounds, that's 10 off, I'm decreasing it as well. So weight also plays a part in this. But in this question, they were more specific to ethnicity. So. Next question. Mr. Jack has pneumonia. You notice he is distressed. You would like him to be comfortable and breathe easier. What is your next intervention? A. Provide Mr. Jack small sips of water. B. Limit Mr. Jack's fluid intake. C. Reposition him to semi-fowlers or high-fowlers. And D. Provide oxygen for him. So the correct answer is C. But before we answer this question, you need to know what pneumonia is. So if you walk into the exam and don't know what pneumonia is, you might have a difficult time answering this question. So this is why it's important to really understand module three, guys. So the last um, topic I covered was the cognitive and mental health which I see people really not doing well in, this is the next one. People really have a hard time with this one. So you need to understand these terms. You need to read over it, understand it so that you do not have any confusion. Because if you think pneumonia is a disease of the brain, for example, you already have missed this question. You won't know what to say, right? But overall, what is pneumonia? Pneumonia is an infection of the air sacs in one or both of the lungs. 
It is characterized by a severe cough with phlegm, fever, chills, and difficulty breathing. So the most appropriate answer in this is, of course, C. Because we are dealing with the respiratory system. And the respiratory system, if you remember, are the lungs. The integumentary system is the skin. The digestive system is anything to do with what we eat and how it comes out, right? The nervous system is anything to do with nerves. The lymphatic system is anything to do with your lymph nodes and that system that interconnects. The cardiac system is anything to do with the heart. So these are systems that you need to know about. So in this particular case, we're talking about the respiratory system. So if I put somebody up in semifallows or high fallows, I'm expanding the lungs and opening them up to more air. Because pneumonia is an infection of the lungs, if I open up the lungs, then at least the person can breathe better. So that's the most right answer. D could be right, but this question was tricky because I want you to understand your scope. You don't just go and give Mr. Jack oxygen. You tell the nurse that I have raised the bed. I feel he needs oxygen. Can you assess? Only a nurse can administer this because oxygen is a medication. So if it was a nursing question, I would definitely put D. But because it's a PSW question, you're going to put C. Because you only put what is in your scope of practice when you are answering questions. And I hope you start to understand that as we go along. Okay, next question. Mr. Beulah has hepatitis. What are the signs and symptoms? Select all that apply. A, jaundice. B, muscle pain. C, itching. D, diarrhea. E, dark colored stools. F, Nausea and vomiting, which we also know as N and V. So the correct answers are A, B, C, D, F. The only missing one is E. So let's explain that a bit further. What is hepatitis? So again, itis, inflammation, right? I hope we're starting to get that by now. But inflammation and HEPA is the liver, so inflammation of the liver. So symptoms include abdominal pain, loss of appetite, fatigue, dark urine, pale stool. It looks like a different color, almost kind of like whitish, like just off. But here on E, they said dark colored stools. So that's how you know that that is wrong. And I know you're saying, Winnie, why would you put this question here? It's so difficult. Do we have to know this? You kind of sort of do. So this is why I always ask people, like when you read stuff in theory, also look up pictures, like understand what pale colored stool looks like. You see a picture, you'll envision it, and then you'll remember it for your exam. But they do ask questions like this, guys. So this is something you need to be aware of. And finally, jaundice is yellowing of the eyes and skin. And if you see an example of jaundice, guys, it's, it's, it's sad. But you can tell that the liver is starting to fail, right? So E is not appropriate because, like I said, pale stool. Next question. Jane recently had a cervical spine injury. What area of the body would you expect to be paralyzed? A, from her waist down. B, on one side of the body. C, on both sides of the body. D, from her neck down. So the correct answer for a cervical is D. It's from the neck down. So for me, the first time I saw this word, I remember I was in school cervical, I thought it was cervix to do with like the reproductive area, right? So <laughs> it took me a while to understand that it meant the neck, but now I remember, thankfully. But um, at the end of the day, spinal cord injuries at the thoracic level or chest area may cause like paraplegia. So I'll explain the two. So paraplegia is like where you have the waist down 
with someone that's in a wheelchair, for example, they're able to move their arms, they're able to do everything, but from the waist down, they cannot move anything, but they're able to put on their makeup or brush their teeth. That's paraplegia, right? Quadriplegia is where it's all four quads. I'm not able to move my arms. I'm not able to move my legs. I'm not able to move anything. That's quad. So the quad I always think of as four and the para, I feel, I feel it means half. So below my waist, right? So injuries in my cervical region because they're at the neck will mean everything below it is not going to work. So now I'm a quadriplegic, right? I'm paralyzed from neck down. Well, not necessarily me, but whoever is experiencing, right? So these clients often need cervical traction and a special bed to keep the spine straight at all times. So that's what, that was the answer for that one. Okay. So the next one, what disease may cause vertigo? Uh, A, failure to thrive, FTT. B, diabetes. C, glaucoma. And D, Meniere's disease. So the correct answer is D. So this is another one that people say, why do I have to know this? You still do. Because you need to understand how to address people who are experiencing these disease progressions or disorders, guys. So the correct answer for vertigo is Meniere's. So what is Meniere's? This is a rare disorder of the inner ear that causes like episodes of vertigo and the sensation of spinning. And it's so difficult. This is where you're just sitting and you see the room going round and round and round. It is almost debilitating. It affects your eyesight. It affects your hearing. It affects even the way you think because everything's just spinning the whole day. So now you don't know what to do. Failure to thrive has nothing to do with this. This is more in that whole development, child development, but I just threw it in for fun, guys. But what is it? So this is to describe infants, babies, or children who are below the norms for body weight, height, growth, or cognitive development. Like I've reiterated, every time you go for a well baby check, you take your child, they're trying to ensure that you're feeding them appropriately. They have certain milestones that need to be met. And if you're not meeting them, that's when they start to investigate. What are you doing? Are you not feeding your child? Are you neglecting your child? Should we get child protective services involved? So this is the FTT that we're talking about right here. Diabetes is a chronic, chronic disorder and it's metabolic. And then the body has high sugar levels for a long period of time. You may need pills, but if you were born with it, which means you're a type one, then you need insulin daily. And you may be on an insulin pump or you might actually inject yourself daily. And lastly, glaucoma. This is to do with the eye. This just means that you have a lot of pressure in your eye. That's pretty much what glaucoma is in a nutshell. So all these terms are very important, guys. And I pick terms from different sections, but I just want you to start to understand what they mean in order for you to pass your exam. What do endocrine glands secrete? A, parathyroid hormone. B, saliva. C, hormones. D, insulin. So the correct answer for this one is A and C. Um, they secrete hormones. Um, so they release and secrete hormones into the bloodstream. Um, some of them are such as metabolism, growth and development, sexual reproduction, heart, heart rate, and blood pressure. So all these things are very important, right? So the answer is, of course, A and C. All right, next question. So this is a matching one. And the matching ones are always a little bit difficult. So just bear with me. But let's match these. Um, so we have A, chime, B, meatus, C, nephron, D, jejunum. And then we have one opening from bladder to urethra. Two, semi-solid liquid in stomach. Three, GI tract that absorbs food. Four, working unit of a kidney. So, um, I'll just give you a few minutes to look over this just to see 
But at the end of the day, these are the right answers. So A, which is chime, is two. So chime is that semi-solid liquid in the stomach. Like once you eat and it's kind of sitting in the stomach and it's starting to mix itself, that's what A is. B, meatus, is one. That's the opening from the bladder to the urethra. C, the nephron, is a working unit of the kidney. And each nephron has like so much. It's so extensive. Like if you look at the anatomy of a nephron, you know, they have the glomerulus that filters stuff. And then they have so many different things. So that is, however, the working unit of the kidney. Each particular organ has its own working unit. That's why you have different cells in different organs. That's why you have a cell, you have an organ, and you have an organ system. Organ system means all the organs come together. But overall, each organ has a different type of cell. So what happens in cancer is if I, for example, see that, oh, okay, this really belongs in the liver, but now it's sitting here in the lung. I can tell there's metastases because something has moved and shifted from where it belongs. That's how I know the cancer has spread. So pretty much the nephron is for the kidney, right? Last but not least, the jejunum. This is a part of the small intestine. And this is number three, the GI tract that absorbs food. All right, next question. Hypothyroidism is a type of endocrine disorder, true or false? The answer is true. So hypothyroidism, hypo, is the most common type of thyroid disorder. In this case, your thyroid gland is not active enough. This tiny gland is found in the front of your neck to make the thyroid hormone. If the gland is underactive, it may not make enough thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormones control how your body uses energy. An endocrine disorder always results in abnormal hormone levels. So what would I expect for someone with hypothyroidism? That they may be overweight, they're very sluggish, they're very tired, they have a difficult time getting out of bed because the thyroid hormone is supposed to give you some type of energy. But if you're not making enough and it's underactive, it decreases your energy level significantly. So that's what causes the problem as well. Next question. You are caring for Mr. Saba. You note that he has pitting edema in his legs and feet. You understand which of the following. A, this is a sign of angina pectoris. B, pitting edema occurs when excess blood, ex, sorry, excess fluid builds up in the body causing swelling, when pressure is applied to the swollen area, a pit or indentation will remain. C, this is normal. D, pitting edema can be resolved with range of motion. So the correct answer is B. So I remember before when I was in high school, guys, people always used to tell me that if you don't know what the answer is, always pick the one with the longest information. Um, this is a good example <laughs> because it's very long, right? Um, but please, please don't follow that in the knack or in your exam. I was just making a joke. But overall, like, yes. So the correct answer here is B, where petting edema occurs when excess fluid builds up in the body, causing swelling, when pressure is applied to the swollen area, and then the indentation remains. Right? So that's what it is. If you look at petting edema, it's where you can put your finger into a particular area, let's say a foot, and it doesn't come up. It just stays there for quite some time. It will eventually come up, but it takes a long time, right? So angina pectoris has nothing to do with this. Angina pectoris means chest pain. And this is not normal to have petting edema. So that is definitely false. And you cannot resolve pitting edema with range of motion. It could be a circulatory problem. Maybe someone has congestive heart failure. Maybe the heart's not pumping enough, or maybe the veins are not backing up the fluid to the heart effectively. So you cannot say that, oh, let me do range of motion and fix this. That is absolutely incorrect. 
Okay guys, so now we're at the final question and thank you so much for bearing with me through this video. And again, please send me your tips or something that you feel you wanna know and I will definitely address it. But this is our final question. The digestive system disorders include the following. Select all that apply. A, vomiting, B, itching, C, anaphylaxis, D, diarrhea, E, flatulence, F, constipation, Jesus. Okay, I, I put quite a lot here. But the correct answers are A, D, E, and F. So what is the digestive system? The digestive system is a system that breaks food down. So what happens as I eat something? I Firstly, I think about the food, right? And then I put it in my mouth. And in my mouth, I have saliva and salivary amylase. That amylase is going to break down that bread that I'm chewing. It goes down, goes down all the way my esophagus through peristalsis. There's that motion that's happening. Now it's in the stomach and it becomes chime, like we said before. It sits there for a while as I digest. My body starts to say, okay, I will take these nutrients from this bread and I'll release this. That type of thing, right? So when we talk about the digestive system, we're talking about me eating all the way to me excreting or being in the toilet and having a bowel movement. Just so you really understand what we're talking about. So when we look at this question, we need to understand that particular canal. So definitely vomiting would be a part of the digestive system because imagine I eat, it doesn't come out, I vomit it out. So that's A. Diarrhea could also be I ate, but I didn't even have time to digest the stuff. I didn't have time to digest my bread. The nutrients haven't even been absorbed, but it came out really quickly. So now I have diarrhea, so that's D. E is flatulence, where I just have gas because maybe I ate a meal, a lot of beans. That's just made me very gassy. F is constipation, where yes, I ate. I'm really expecting to have gone to the washroom by now. This is now day four. I'm miserable and I'm constipated. So once you understand these small principles as to what a system entails or what it means, then you'll understand how to address these particular questions. So what are the ones we did not pick? We didn't pick B and C, itching and anaphylaxis. That has nothing to do with me and what I eat, guys. These are more allergic reactions to something. Itching is an allergic reaction, but anaphylaxis for sure is an even deeper allergic reaction. If anyone is in a state of anaphylaxis, they need to go to the hospital. This is urgent care. And lastly, a cyst is an integumentary or skin disorder. This is just a fluid-filled sac. It has nothing to do with a digestive system disorder. All right. So I'm hoping that was helpful, guys. Um, I will be back um, in the next module to just share more. Um, if you have any suggestions for me or recommendations, please for sure let me know. Just put them even in the chat and I will definitely get back to you. Have a wonderful day. And for those of you who are about to write, good luck and all the best. Bye.